that leads us to today's sermon and sermon title. Remember, repent, and return to living love. Remember, repent, and return to living love. Now let's turn, and I invite you to turn along in your Bible that you brought. It will also have this up on the screen to the final book of the Bible, the book of the Apocalypse, or the Revelation of Jesus Christ to John, and through John to the Lord's servants and churches. Hear now God's word from Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will indeed stand forever. Amen. Right now, on Tuesday mornings, we're doing a more intensive Bible study of the book of Revelation. I certainly encourage you to be with me if you're interested in studying the book of Revelation, which really connects with the entire Bible and kind of brings the message to bear. That's, there's, it's not by accident. It's the closing and climactic book of the entire scriptures. In Revelation chapters 2 and 3, we encounter the seven edicts or messages, seven, count that, seven edicts or messages, commonly referred to by Bible studies and by a lot of commentators as letters. They're not letters, they're edicts. Um, seven edicts or messages to the, count them, seven churches. So let's just unpack this for a moment again. Join me on Tuesday mornings if you want to go into more of this type of thing, but just briefly, seven. Seven. Remember, seven is one of the biblical numbers of completeness that runs all the way through the entire Bible. It's the key number of completion you need to understand about the intersection of God, the creator, with his creation. And you're, of course, told that from the get-go, Genesis 1 and bridging into the beginning of Genesis 2. How many days are there in the creation order? There are seven, right? And it runs all the way through the scripture. You're encountering seven all over the place, the seven cycles of Isaiah. We talked about that when we preached through Isaiah, running all the way through New Testament. Matthew's, not just John, John does a lot of sevens, the seven signs, um, the seven I am statements of Jesus. That's not, that's not by accident, right? And uh, certainly Matthew, Matthew's gospel, you remember in the Sermon on the Mount, some of you are studying the Sermon on the Mount. Hopefully you looked at the structure of the Sermon on the Mount, the double sevens with the sequences running through that, with the language. When you unpack the Greek language, you know, you get that all the way through. I've been highlighting sevens for you as we move through Luke's gospel. And again, most famously, John's gospel, uh, running all the way over to Revelation. What is the number seven, seven? the number three, the number for God, the triune God, intersecting with the classic number for creation, both the world and creation, north, south, east, west, the so-called four corners of the earth. You know, the Bible doesn't think the earth is flat. This is symbolic, poetic language uh, for the four message for all creation. So when you put together God, the creator, with his creation, and when he's intersecting with his creation all the way from the creation account of Genesis 1 forward, 
number seven, you, you have to understand that to even begin to kind of open up the Bible, right? So we encounter this again with the book of Revelation, lots of sevens, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls of wrath. You're gonna miss basically what you're reading in Revelation if you're not at least getting that and some of the other numerical reference. Uh, but in any event, we here we have, of course, seven edicts to seven churches. Number for completion, intersection of God with creation and with his new creation of the church. So there are seven churches, which means, in other words, we're talking about a representative completeness of all churches across all time. Okay? However, these are specifically seven historic major churches in the circle of the western part of Asia Minor. So Asia Minor is the pivotal part, east meets west, economic hub, international hub of the Roman Empire of the first century, and by the way, extending all the way through the fourth century AD, okay? This is the money, money center. This is the axis center. It's not by accident that Constantine, the emperor, in the fourth century moves the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome to Asia Minor. So you're looking at kind of the center of a whole lot of stuff that runs all the way over, you know, um, in the direction of India, all the way over kind of trade routes from China all the way through what we would call the Mediterranean, well, the Mediterranean world and what you would call Europe. So, uh, yes, yes, the Romans are up in England and Gaul or France, Germania, but this is the center of the treasury, so to speak, okay? Um, and Ephesus is the largest city in Asia Minor and the most significant and one of the three most important cities of the Roman Empire. So you start off with the message and Ephesus also geographically is closest to Patmos where John is exiled. So you start off, it's, the letters are gonna run a circle, but uh, you start off with Ephesus. What is Ephesus? I've already told you it is the supreme metropolis of Asia. It also was very proud of its title of being the temple warden city the temple warden city. Historically, that means it's a temple warden of the great temple of Artemis. If you've read the book of Acts, you remember about the whole thing about Artemis, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, okay? Paul would run into that. Uh, but by this time, by the time this message is coming from Jesus through John, Ephesus is also making the claim to be the temple warden of emperor worship in the Roman Empire. Emperor worship is hot in Asia Minor. It's still a contested issue over in the old city, capital city of Rome. People connected with the Senate and the Republic are very much in opposition to the emperor worship that develops, you know, after Julius Caesar's death and then Caesar Augustus, et cetera, running all the way through the Caesars and running through the first century, but it is hot and it's a big deal and it means you're a good citizen and you're probably gonna be better uh, financially and commercially connected, and it just makes a lot of sense to be an em emperor worshiper in Asia Minor towards the close of the first century. Uh, this letter, uh, or this message, this book, uh, Revelation, possibly written in the 60s, some commentators believe that during the latter part of Emperor Nero Caesar's reign, during the persecution of the Christians, and of course, leading up to the, uh, and involving the Jewish rebellion in Jerusalem. Majority of commentators believe this is in the 90s, the early to mid 90s, during the uh, reign of Emperor Domitian, during the latter years of his reign. That's the way I read Revelation, but really it's, I, it doesn't matter. We can go back to Nero in the 60s, Domitian. But let me just point out to you that by the time we get to Domitian, Domitian himself, his favorite title for him in his closing years, which means, you know, early 90s, through 96, his favorite title for himself, this is an emperor, this is a man living on earth now, is Dominus et Deus Noster, which is our Lord and our God, okay? 
That's his title for himself. And if you're probably a leading person in Ephesus, you're probably riding along with that way. Um, so, Jesus describes himself in relation to his church, his larger church, and certainly the church in Ephesus. Now, you know if you're in the Bible study with me on Tuesday mornings, because we did a lot of work with Revelation chapter 1, Jesus picks up on some of the descriptions back and forth from Revelation 1 to the letters to the churches in 2 and 3. Okay? So, so there are different aspects of Jesus' sovereignty that are highlighted in these different letters. Here, Jesus describes himself in relation to his church in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. The words of him who, and I think, I've, yeah, I've got this up for you so you can follow me here. This is straight out of Revelation 2. The words of him who, number one, holds the seven stars in his right hand. Okay, that means he has control over the angels and ultimately he gives the Holy Spirit or does not give the Holy Spirit. Okay, number two, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. That means he is in the midst of the churches, these specific churches and the fullness of his church over all time. Okay, Jesus is with us if we're a living church. Number three, Jesus says, I know your works. In other words, he knows exactly what we are doing as a church and in our individual households and in our individual lives and he diagnoses what's happening with us he is in in the bible when you talk about knowing that means he's intimately familiar with us intimately personally familiar with us uh, to the angel um, i just tell you my reading of this is actually angel angelos is not just messenger it's an angel uh, the angel of his church at ephesus and then we get commendations but also conviction, commands, and caveat. Commendations. I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but I have tested, but you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you found them to be false. And he keeps going with this for another verse. And, uh, you know, as I said on Tuesday morning a couple weeks ago, man, it'd be nice if we could just close it and say, yeah, we're doing pretty well, Jesus. I mean, we're doctrinally sound. We follow the Bible. We have really good Bible quiet times. We know the Bible. We know what false teaching is and what good teaching is. We're totally in on the whole gospel thing. Uh, but then Jesus brings the conviction. And this is relevant to most churches and most Christians, I have to tell you. But I have this against you that you have abandoned the love, pain, agapain, you had it first. As Caird says in his commentary, the one quality within, without which all others are worthless. Remember 1 Corinthians 13, right? And Jesus is talking about active verb type love here. Remember Ephesians 6, love. You can look good. You can dress up and come to church. You can sing the right songs. You can even be good about Bible study and doctrine. But if this is out, it's all out, according to Jesus. All spirit-born, born-anew Christians and his true church actively, actively love in an inspired, God-breathed love the Lord, number one, Number two, one another are passionate about one another, brothers and sisters in the fellowship. Love one another in the same way I've loved you. In other words, they're not going to miss church, and they're not just going to miss church for worship. They're going to want to know each other and care for each other and pray for each other and help each other and encourage each other in the faith. There will be love for each other in the church family. There will actually be a church family, vibrant. And number three, and I think this is what this message from Jesus is primarily about, they will love their neighbors and specifically unbelievers among their neighbors and unbelievers out in the world. The Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Pull back and look at this from Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through the beginning of 6. John, to these seven churches that are in Asia, grace and peace. Number one, from him who is and who was and who is to come. That means God the Father. A okay, trinity here. Number two, from the seven spirits. Seven spirits means the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Remember, seven, fullness, completion, God in, interacting with his creation. From the seven spirits 
who are before his throne, well, who's left in the Trinity? Father, Spirit, and number three, from Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to listen to this description. This is in, John, this is in Revelation chapter one. The faithful witness, in other words, someone who proclaims himself publicly. Are you catching this? The faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler, in other words, the king of kings, the ruler of the kings on earth, to him who loves us, that's present participle. I'll come back to that. That's really important. Who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Okay, now look at this. His public testimony is all the way to the cross. You think he was kind of keeping it under wraps? I don't want to, like, interrupt anybody. No, he's going to the cross for our salvation. That's his witness. And made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, which means we are supposed to be mediators to the world. We're supposed to be actually out intersecting the world as a kingdom of priests, serving our God and being his mediators to the world. Okay, him who loves us, that is a present tense participle. That's a big deal. I'll keep coming back to that. Who has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom priest to his God and Father. What, so what is Jesus' convicting note to the church at Ephesus? Well, again, they would claim they love God. They would claim they love each other. They're keeping good doctrine. They're fellowshipping together. They've rejected false teaching. But what about their intersection, their witness, their passion for mission to people who aren't already with them? What about their commitment to the Great Commission overseas? What about their outreach and naming in the name of Jesus to their neighbors who don't come to church with them? What about that? We've got a problem. Jesus talks about this all the way back in the Olivet Discourse. This is in Matthew chapter 24, verses 11 through 14. And let me show you where this is going. Jesus says, in many false prophets, this is in the last days, uh, will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love, hey, agape, you see that? It's right there again. There's the same term Jesus is using here. The love of many will grow cold. The love of many for reaching others. For naming Jesus to people out in the world will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed. This is where Jesus is going with this. This is what Jesus is interested in. His, he loved the world like unsaved people so much that he gave his life, right? And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony, as a witness to all nations. Are you in on it? Are you engaged in it? Is your prayer life revolving around this as a key aspect? Is your stewardship revolving? I mean, are, you, are you in love with the mission of Christ? So let's look at this, his commands. If we've got a little bit of, let's just say, not quite on fire for this. Number one, I'll fill in the blanks for you. You've got in the sermon notes. Number one, remember. It's a sermon title, it's straight out of the scripture, okay? Number one, remember. Number two, repent. Number three, this is not straight out of the scripture. It's a summary return. And then what Jesus says, do the works you did at first. When you were passionate, when the church was new, when you were new in your Christianity, like telling people about Jesus, reaching out, inviting people, hosting people. Number one, remember. Remind you, right? Hopefully. Lord's Supper. Jesus says, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's not just an internal spiritual thing. It is part of the message and the mission of the cross. Taking the supper. As Paul says, when you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As Jesus puts it multiple times, you've got it in the Sermon on the Mount, you've got it here in Mark 4, 21, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket? I mean, how foolish would that be? Like, if God has saved you, you are a lamp. If God has called us as a church, we are supposed to be a lamp that shows light. You don't hide it under a bushel basket. If you're not talking to other people about Jesus this week, last week, when you came from the Lord's Supper, if you were not on fire to spread the mission to your neighborhood and the schools and the world, we got to disconnect, Jesus is saying. Is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed, 
Is it not set on a lampstand? What do you think God is doing with us or what he intends for us to be, right? For you, for your family, for your household. And Jesus says this, for whoever is ashamed of me in my words, of him will the son of man be ashamed when he comes in his glory for the judgment. How often are you naming the name of Jesus to others? I mean, be honest, not just friends that you know it's gonna be okay with, not just in political conversations about which candidate you're pulling for. That's, that, is not, that is not testimony, that is not, that is not gospel witness. I'm talking about actual gospel witness. Number two, and this is the central one, of course, this is really pretty much sums up the whole thing, repent. And repentance is not simply being sorry. It includes being sorry. It's not just, oh, Jesus, in my private little prayer time, I'm praying for you to forgive me. That's not just repentance. Should we do that? Yes, of course. But repentance is primarily, metanoia is primarily turning, turning away from sin. If I do things bad all the time and I tell Nancy, well, I'm just sorry about it, honey, and I do the same thing tomorrow, is that real repentance? No. All I did was say I was sorry. That's Jesus is like, look, I know. Look, I know you totally. Jesus says, I want you to turn from sin and turn back to me. That's repentance. Turn to God in his way. And then number three, return. Do the works you did at first. Return to works empowered by the Holy Spirit and showing the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Where lives are changed. And frankly, where you're changed because you're putting yourself out on the line for Jesus. It's gonna change your, it will rock your family if you actually love Jesus and are committed to him above that ball team and that agenda and that party and that Mississippi State activity. I'm telling you, uh, you know, it will change your world. It will rock your family, it will rock your heart if you actually love Jesus. And then we get the exhortation and promise to the churches for conquerors and for overcomers, which leads to the tree of life and the paradise of God. I don't know about you, but I sure would like to be in on that, you know? I definitely don't want to go somewhere else where there is no life, you know, sustaining capability. Um, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Notice this is plural, this is not just Ephesus. All, all, he keeps coming back to this, every, every one of the seven, what the Spirit says to the totality of the churches. That means you and me too. Jesus commits to save all in the church who actually hear and actually obey him and who therefore conquer and overcome sin and fear in the way of the cross. Living love via gospel witness and invitation to non-believers. Gracious stewardship. I mean, love to give for the mission of the church. Love to both impact people locally. And I mean, I'm telling you, if you've got a hard heart against God's mission to the lost, We've got a major problem. It's not just like you need to repent. We've got a problem with a heart that is sold out against Jesus and his mission to people in other parts of the world and into our own neighborhood. By the way, if you want to join me in a mission this week to the prison down at Walnut Grove, I've got a meeting Tuesday night. I'm telling you, people who sit back in pews and complain about, well, why are we having to worry about this or that? that Jesus is calling you out in conviction right now. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And this you know, echoes what Jesus said throughout all his ministry, picking up on Isaiah chapter 6, right? If, if, you, if you can hear me, I invite you to hear me, because I'm being serious, Jesus says. Now to the one who conquers, Nikonti, you guys know Nike, the sports brand, right? Same, same basis, right? Victory. Like, you know, Idolatry of victory. Here it gets transformed into victory with Christ. I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. All the way back to the Old Testament, Proverbs 11. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who is wise does what? Wins souls. That's Proverbs chapter 11. Francis Turretin. Great theologian, a couple generations after Calvin, served, you know, taught in Geneva. Christ is himself the true tree of life. 
because as mediator, he is the Prince of life, giving life to the world and eternal life in heaven by glory. For he is himself, the resurrection and the life, who will most certainly bestow upon his own eternal life. Truly he is the only tree, Turgeon says, because no one except Christ is the author of eternal life. There's no salvation in anyone else. No one except Christ is in the midst of paradise and of the street of the city. To the one who conquers. Now you may be asking yourself, how could I possibly conquer? And I'm going to tell you, Jesus will empower you to if you will turn yourself over to him and if our church turns ourselves over to him. 1 John 5, 4. Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. How? Well, here's the answer. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes nika, it's the Greek term again there, the world, and this is the nike, the victory, that has overcome the world. Here it is, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world but the one who believes in Jesus as the Son of God? Paul says it this way in Romans 8, 37. Know in all these things we are more than conquerors. Who pair nikomain? It's awesome, isn't it? We're super conquerors. I mean, we're, we're uber conquerors through him who loved us. Do you hear that? Through Jesus who loved us, who loved us. But it's not just loved us past tense. It's loves us right now. Back to Revelation 1. This is why I think it's so key that you know Revelation 1 to understand the wrap-up of the New Testament. Him who loves us, present tense. Do you follow me? This is present tense. Revelation 1, 5 and 6, has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom and priest to his God and Father. And here's where we're going, because Jesus can empower you. Will you give yourself to Jesus? Jesus will empower you all the way home. I'm telling you, all the way home through the middle of the street of the city. This is the close of the book of Revelation, Revelation 22. We open with this scene of the, the uh, New Jerusalem. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the tree of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit. In other words, the fullness of your life and all time, okay? Uh, 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the, here it is again, the Great Commission, are you catching this? Were for the healing of the nations. And as Turretin says, he is the resurrection and life, who will most certainly bestow upon his own eternal life. We're called to this ministry. We're called to this witness as a church and you individually. And I invite you to be part of it to know the power of loving Jesus and the love of Jesus working through your life. And that's kind of the call on Reed and Madeline right now as they move forward. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.